Well, today, this uh, particular topic, we're talking about TCO, um, total cost of EV ownership. And I want you to introduce you to some of my friends who are coming to chat with me. Please welcome Mike Potter from Drive Electric, Carl Anders from Nissan, and Greg Fairbotham from Zoom EV. Because frankly, I don't know enough on my own. I like having friends on stage. Um, back in, actually, I was going to start this by saying, back in February of this year, um, a, uh, a scientific uh, technology website uh, called Ars Technica published a, uh, a feature saying that um, EVs have got the, uh, the best, um, the best uh, cost of ownership over all types of vehicle. So let's start by reminding people, obviously, there's a government incentive that still exists. Four and a half thousand pounds off all new uh, EVs. Uh, and we can also talk about not just EVs, but plug-in hybrids and non-plug-in hybrids, because I think fully charged, I, or certainly me, Robert less so, it still wants to embrace the plug-in, because I think it's a really good stepping stone car for people that uh, drive of pure petrol or diesel and want to migrate uh, ultimately into a battery, pure battery car. So. Do you want me to go start with that? So basically, yeah. at the moment, what government has uh, putting in to try and increase EV uptake is for cars, for full electric, battery electric vehicles, it's four and a half thousand pounds, but that's done by the dealer, so that's included in the price of the vehicle when you buy it. Um, in terms of plug-in hybrids, it's two and a half thousand pounds, and in terms of vans, people are looking at electric vans, uh, that's either uh, eight thousand pounds or 20 percent. But because the cost is actually a lot lower than people think, uh, it means that it's usually the uh, the 20 percent so and that's guaranteed at current rate until october and government has guaranteed that there will be a grant of some form um, until 2020 so we still have a bit further to go uh, but the idea is long term that won't be needed um, but that's really to help with the uptake in these early times so if we want to talk about um, total cost of ownership uh, we there's a fundamental change with electric vehicles that's similar to the things that we see with uh, solar. Uh, the, what you find is that the, the running costs come down dramatically. So uh, like the marginal cost, as we call it. So the fuel and the maintenance are going to shrink dramatically, especially for battery cars. But the money that you have to invest at the front end is probably a little bit more. The other major component with cars, which is a little bit more unusual, is the depreciation. And it's probably the biggest cost that you carry on your car, even if it's a diesel or petrol one, unless you drive a lot of miles and you spend a lot of money on fuel. And guessing how much your car is going to be worth in the future is a bit of an art, and one that we spend quite a bit of time on. Uh, I wish I could say that I get it right all the time. My, my dad was really good at that. He bought a brand new car in 1976 and we traded it in in 1999 because he wanted maximum value from his car that he bought new. And I learned to drive in it and everybody else in my family. He probably did okay out of that. I he imagine. did all right out of that. I didn't crash it. It was all right. So one, uh, one aspect of EVs that's very different with that approach is um, the maintenance is much lower. So we uh, find that brake pads last three times longer in battery cars than normal. And that's real figures. We run 1,500 of these things. Uh, so, and apart from that, the servicing is, well, non-existent. I have to say, pretty, pretty low. They need an inspection to make sure that the wheels are not going to fall off and that sort of thing. But they need so <laughs> Carl's little, face is like so little. A bit more than that, sure. Mike. Because <laughs> obviously the servicing is, uh, is very, very low. The wear and tear, as you say, is low. But uh, no, we do have to change the air conditioner filter every year and the brake uh, fluid every two years. Yeah. There's less moving parts in an EV than there is in a normal automatic gearbox. Yeah. I suppose that's the thing, isn't it? If you've got regen braking on electric cars, the brake pads get used less, so there's less dust, there's less wear. Um, electric motors themselves are very maintenance uh, light. Um, so by very nature, it, it comes down to the stuff that you have to do on normal cars, which is, like you say, brake fluid um, and checking the steering and doing, doing the safety checks uh, rather than and plugging into a laptop to make sure everything's behaving itself. Sorry, Greg, you're going to say something? Uh, I guess um, for me in thinking about cars, a lot of people obviously put an emphasis on fuel. Um, and I will say it, my background is actually oil and gas. Um, Don't boo him. 
don't. No. Don't. Um, but I then got into EVs. Um, and I think actually when you think about it from the petrol side of things, in the last month we've seen petrol go up 10, 15% at the pumps. I drove here and I saw yesterday diesel a £1.50 a litre. Yeah. That's unbelievable. So, you know, the, the sort of the variability of the prices on that fuel side should also absolutely be taken into consideration. Um, electricity is cheaper when the price of fuel is cheaper, but actually it's a great thing for us when the, the price of fuel is that expensive. Just go back to the uh, depreciation thing. So I think the, the maths on the rest of it is pretty straightforward. So your fuel's going to be roughly 15 pounds of electricity for every 100 pounds you would have spent in, in petrol or diesel, roughly. That, that's going to vary quite a bit. Uh, the maintenance is easily a third of what you were going to spend normally. Um, and that kind of leaves you with, right, how much the car cost how, and, and how much am I going to lose value on it? And what we believe you'll find is uh, the way that cars depreciate doesn't change that much over time. What does, what does change is discounting and volume of cars at the front end of the market. And one feature of EVs at the moment is there more people want them than there are cars around. Is that right, Carl? Thank you for that, yes, which actually gets back to some conversations we've had recently. Um, but the point on depreciation is you find that it's changed a lot. So for us, most um, vehicles are on a three-year contract. So at last year, we had a huge increase in vehicles coming back off contract. So we had 3,000 used LEAF used cars coming through, up from about 400 vehicles a year before. So there's a big increase in the supply of used EVs. However, what we've found is the demand, because now people have realized that these are very, very reliable and they're going to be um, you know, usable for a long time, the demand is actually going faster that, sorry, than, the, than the supply of used EVs. So the residual values uh, in the last year, even though we went from 400 to 3,000 supply, the old 30 kilowatt leaf, the residual value actually went up. So it was worth, even though halfway through the year we announced the first generation two car, the 40, the, at the end of the year, it was worth more um, than the, the start of the year. Of course, an EV sales last year went up by 50%, is that right? So a, a massive, a uh, how many, 150,000 cars? Um, we, we, so we're talking bigger numbers. And also, uh, when you're talking the real basics, like obviously no tax for an electric car, so big incentive for some people. Um, I see a lot of people that own Teslas predominantly bought through their business rather than as a personal owner, which is why I guess you see so many, what is quite an expensive car bought cleverly. So even if you're not thinking environmentally, you're thinking just about saving lots of cash. Yeah, I, I, we, when we started on electric cars, I, I always said that we should do it because it's, um, it's cheaper and better. Yeah. Like the green angle is, is great. And I think it's a, I, I might not be popular, but it's a side benefit, I believe, to what should happen for people. Yeah. Uh, this will work because the cars are better to drive. Who drives an EV here? We've got, yeah, would you go back to a diesel, any of you, or petrol? No one. Uh, no who, one goes who back. Who drives a plug-in of some sort here? That's not that many. Which is a surprise, which means there's a lot of you listening to this who are, what, considering buying... Who's considering buying an electric car? OK, an ah. enormous amount of you. Sorry, I don't have that many business cards with me, but uh, we've got a stand out there, OK? <laughs> no, but this is really fascinating because when, when, when Ray and Robert uh, started to, to come up with the idea of doing this show, um, we thought that most people who would come here would be already electric car owners and would already, you know, we would be preaching to the converted, as it were. And actually, I think it's the other way around. There's a lot of you who maybe are on the cusp of it, have been considering it, and you're coming here to just make that final decision. You were, you were, you were in the middle of chatting, I know. We sell leasing, so I'm going to say this. But one thing about leasing is we take the strain out of worrying about the depreciation because you get to know it in, in advance. And then I have to have the sleepless nights about whether I've done the right thing. So it is something to consider. It's not for everyone, I understand that. But that is one of the, the, one of the features of that. The other thing that I think is important is the difference in energy cost if you're public charging v home charging. 
And home charging is going to get even cheaper as we get smart tariffs. There's a lot of energy companies here that are coming up with new ways to, to get the cost of that down. So home charging is going to be the cheapest way of doing that for, for quite a while, I think. I think I'd probably add to that from a more energy play. Um, the end of the day, there's a lot of renewable companies here as well. The more renewable energy gets deployed, renewable energy is effectively a technology, which means as we deploy more, we get better at it, which means we produce more. If that energy is free, it means it will be cheaper. So from a total cost of ownership perspective, actually, the better we get at deploying renewables, the more we put in can actually impact the cost to your EV. And let us not forget, if you then go a step further on the technology side and V2G, which I know is the next talk, you've then potentially got the ability to sort of send energy back to your house to utilize it or make money from the grid. And I think you've also got to think about um, something we do, because I work a lot with fleets, and they have cars and vans on fleet for sort of three, four, five years. So if you look at it in terms of total cost of ownership, because the operating cost is such a small percentage, you need to think about, if you're going to keep a car for four or five years, you've got to think of the taxation structure. You've got to think about what fuel is going to cost in the next three, four, five years. So if you're just looking about the business case now today, petrol or diesel versus electric, you've got to think about where we're going to be in two or three years because you're still going to have that car. And because it's a smaller percentage, it means that if electricity goes up 10% and petrol and diesel goes up 10%, it'll have a much bigger impact on what you're paying for a vehicle over the life, if it's a petrol or a diesel compared to electric. It future proofs. So we've seen government doing things like um, congestion charging, um, ultra low emission zones, et cetera. You've got to think about what is going to be in the next three or four years where an EV will get you out of all that and also lock you into a lower um, fuel cost. And actually, as someone that works for Nissan, um, this show has got a lot of household renewable technology, uh, technology as well as vehicles. And the reason for that is because we, we know that people either start with an, uh, an eco car and then think, shall I be a bit clever about how I charge it? Or they have a house that's really uh, energy efficient and then they go, maybe I should make my car a bit more efficient. And there's this moment of convergence. And some people are doing both and some people are just doing one and thinking of the other. And like Nissan, for example, re, re, uh, re, reuses the uh, batteries from the older Leaf vehicles into home battery storage. So I think that's why they're intrinsically linked. So if you have a, an eco car and you want to make it even more efficient, that's when you start thinking about how your home charging network uh, can be more clever. Absolutely. So, so one, of, one of the great things, I think we've already touched on it, uh, we've been studying with University of Reading about, um, how to use smart charging with uh, the cars that we have. And the great thing is the cheaper the energy is, the more clean it is as well. So we think that we can get smart charges, drop the price of uh, energy for our, our customers by about 30%, and they get a real drop in the real CO2 of 30% as well. So it's, you know, that, that, that seems like the right thing to do. So I'm just gonna, a bit of a tangent. Uh, I like, we won't I like have many tangents. people, not, not too much of a tangent. We won't have, I don't think we'll have so many people with vans here, but if anyone runs vans in central London, we don't understand why you don't run EVs. It's £5,000 a year cheaper to run a van in central London. And that buys you a really good one. holiday. Yeah. And so, shoes. Uh, and, and literally with the electric vans, because the ones we've just announced and we're just actually releasing now, the 40 kilowatt hour batteries, um, the real world range of those is, you know, up around 120 miles and so. It's pretty hard to do that kind of mileage in central London or Birmingham or Leeds or Manchester or wherever. So we're now at the stage where a lot of these delivery vans only need charging every few days because even right across uh, the UK, the average is it something like 50, 50 miles a day for a van. So, you know, you can actually run it for days before you even have to charge it. Again, not as an advert, but just to give you frame the, uh, how this might work. We le we're leasing electric cars from about 200 quid up to, well, a thousand pound for a Tesla, but between 200 and 350 a month. So it's not that much more than a diesel or petrol car in a lot of cases. That's if you were going to buy a new car and a lot of people wouldn't buy a new car. And very often that making that difference, you have to compare apples with apples. Um, 
But if you're spending, you know, if you save 100 pounds in, in fuel costs, hopefully that makes the maths really simple to work out that, yeah, this, this can work. Then you've just got to get around the practicalities from there, really, I think. And even if you only use, like, our or other lease companies, our available prices as a way to gauge whether it's a good thing to do, it's a good place to start and have a look. I don't normally do Q&As on these sessions, but I thought this is something which there's probably many questions on. And while we've got, like, six minutes or so, I was going to uh, open the, uh, the, the floor to questions. You mentioned that there were um, kind of paybacks from the government for buying a new EV. Is that also the case for the used EVs that you have? No, it doesn't. So basically the grant's only paid once, so it's a UK government grant, so on a new vehicle, but it's all taken care of by the supplying dealer. There isn't any grants on used ones because the way that the Office of Low Emissions Vehicles sees it, that they've already paid 4,500 to get it onto the road, so what they're not going to do is keep paying again and again and again on the same vehicle. I mean, we, we've, we've actually had conversations with Olaf because we've known that there's potentially things happening with the subsidy there. Um, and obviously one of the things that, you know, the reason we, that we got into low emission vehicles is actually a way that people can actually offset the ownership in the first place. So, for example, you know, whether it's a new car or a used car, actually, if you own that vehicle, it's registered in your name. Then actually, I don't know how many people have used Airbnb here, but the sharing economy now is a phenomenal tool. Um, you know, you've, oh, someone put their hand up over there. One person. Fan, now, who fan uses stick. Airbnb here? Who uses Airbnb here? See, look, look, okay, what? Okay. Maybe half of you. Yeah. So I I'm mean, not very you, good at maths. If you if you look at the the trajectory of low emission vehicles and EVs, it goes like this: the sharing economy was worth 17 billion last year. It's going up to 300 billion in 2025. And a fundamentally, and um, we've had conversations with manufacturers. Actually, ownership as a model is changing. Obviously, um, Mike. At, you know, drive electrics, leasing. You know, people are thinking about things differently now. You know, like a generation that is 10 years behind me at university, the statistics show vehicle ownership just isn't actually a key part of what they see in their future. And that whole model is changing. So actually sharing vehicles, utilizing vehicles when you need them on demand is, is coming through. But on the peer-to-peer -peer side, if you're looking at that vehicle, there are ways in actually you can offset that cost without necessarily having to have four and a half thousand pounds through Olev. This is a question for, for Carl, maybe Mike. Um, I'm a Mondeo man. I'm a salesman living on the road doing 45,000 miles a year. When are we going to see the Mondeo type equivalent car, the Primera of the 1990s, reproduced as a full EV for those uh, tax breaks for the, for the uh, benefit in kind and such? Well, you could kind of argue that in some ways that's already studying now, but in terms of getting into higher mileage, there's a lot of research and development. So as an industry, uh, we're putting a lot into battery technology, but also in terms of bigger batteries, uh, different uh, chemistry, but also how the vehicle uses it more. So you're going to find over the next few years the um, range that they'll do between charges and the way you use those to hop between charges will change. So it's not that far away. Um, it really depends on what you need them. But what I would say is an electric vehicle isn't for everything. So if you need to move two or three people around the city, a bus isn't very useful. But if you need to move 50 people around, a Vauxhall Corsa is not very useful. So it's the idea that currently the EVs can do most um, applications, but there are some which we can't do yet. So doing 400 miles a day is probably not ideal now to do it, but what I would say is it's moving so fast that within the next you know, scope of maybe two years it will be even, even higher. So it will get, it will get uh, a lot more applications. Thanks. Uh, just uh, wouldn't mind if you could just discuss the pros and cons of battery leasing. Um, so Renault, uh, Re Renault are the ones I remember I might be a bit controversial. Never, ever, ever buy a car with a battery lease, all right? Okay. Um, Mike's own opinion, obviously. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the, um, we've, we, we, because we've been doing it a long time, we owned a few vehicles with battery leases. There's a fundamental about how this works out that makes it not very palatable uh, on the agreements that are out there at the moment, okay? Okay. Um, when you buy a battery lease and it's 60, 70, 80 quid a month for a new car that's sort of 12,000, 15,000 pounds, as a percentage, it's kind of okay. When it moves to being a used car that's five or 6,000 pounds, it's too much. 
and they're really difficult to sell. So it, 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 and that, that, I think, is the feature of it that makes it quite difficult. And actually, there's a thing called a guarantee, because a lot of people think, well, it, it makes sure that the battery is going to be OK. And the guarantees are great on these things. Well, so I think, eight, oh, that's eight years. So that's that's the years. thing. I think the reason why they came in was because uh, to put at rest people's uh, scepticism about batteries degrading very quickly and the car being worthless. But I think we've proved now, or many manufacturers have proved, yeah. the we, quality and density of batteries is such that that's not the case. Well, we've done 320,000 of these electric vehicles now. So, you know, we, we know that these are ultra, ultra reliable with the batteries. We did offer um, battery lease. Uh, as well as uh, buy the car with the battery. We've now deleted it right across all the cars and vans because the uptake was actually quite low. We, I, we've got to finish this now. Unfortunately, we can't answer all of your questions, but what I would urge you to do is co collar these three men uh, if you see them at some point today. Uh, and there's many other specialists on various stands here to answer any questions you have because the great thing about this show, I think, is the people here are so enthusiastic and they're very, very willing to help others to understand um, any areas which you're not sure about with, the, with regards to EVs or renewables. So, uh, once again, thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you to these guys, Mike, Carl, and Greg.